Hi, Alan Stratton from As What Turns. After returning from an AAW symposium, I turned this, which imitated a demonstration by Max Brosi. He called it his bat form. The, uh, and I turned an, a, an ornament from it, but it was very difficult to turn and almost didn't make it. And I gave that ornament away at our Christmas uh, club's Christmas social, and my wife didn't appreciate it going away. She wanted another one, but that was a very difficult process to just scale this down to this. So I've tried multiple times to do it again, and now I think I've got the process down to where I can scale this down to make a very good smaller Christmas ornament that's very similar to. It resembles a sea urchin, except that this has never seen the sea. It is been just wood grown on land. So I'd like to turn this and also invite you that if you subscribe to my website, not just YouTube, but my website, I will invite you to a live interactive remote demonstration where I will turn another of these on the 17th. So uh, subscribe on the website. If you get my emails already, you're okay, you're good. And then we'll see you on the 17th for another live demonstration of this one. But meanwhile, let's do the short version. This wood is lilac from a horribly overgrown lilac. The wood is green and barely big enough to get the ornament out of it, but since I'll be drilling out the pith anyway, I think the green wood will work. I've mounted a short section between centers on the lathe. It does not take long to peel off the bark with my bowl gouge and trim the ends to form a cylinder. Next, I need the measures for an octagon that will contain my sphere. The diameter is 2.38. Therefore, the distance from the top to the first corner at 0.293 times the diameter is 0.697. The octagon side is 0.414 times the diameter for 0.985 inches. Since I have a good top to the cylinder already, I'm choosing to mark that diameter on the top of the cylinder. I never use pointed dividers with the lathe running to make a mark. That's just too dangerous. Now go ahead and mark the measures on the side of the cylinder. This lets me know where the bottom of the octagon needs to be. There's too much wood on this end, so for this end, I'm turning down the cylinder to a diameter equal to the target side measure. With the first set of corners established, it's time to cut corners off the square cylinder and turn it into an octagon. Then split each side in half with a pencil mark and split each again. This marks off a new set of corners that need to be cut next. Cut these corners, then proceed to round it off by eye. I don't need a perfect sphere for this project. I need a tenon, but it must be small and as close to the ends as possible. I measured my smallest chuck jaws and made this mark on both ends, then cut a very shallow mortise on both ends. Then switch to a chuck mount. Actually, I like a chuck for the next couple of operations. I'm drilling a three-quarter inch hole in from both ends of the sphere, and the greenwood drills very quickly and easily at this diameter. I also need the chuck for indexing. I want 8 divisions around the sphere. My chuck has 24 divisions. So that I do not lose track, I'm wrapping some masking tape around the chuck and marking every third index spot. Then with a piece of wood and a pointer, I can rotate around the chuck and make marks at the equator at each target index. Finally, punch each intersection. Now for the fun part. I'm using a small spur drive center and mounting the sphere between two opposite index marks. Since I'll be cutting a cove through another mark, I'm drilling a small hole where that mark is so that I know where it is at the bottom of the cove. Then mark halfway to the next index and extend that mark both ways on both sides of the sphere. 
Please note that the lines do not converge. Then cut a flat between the marks before cutting a cove. The flat is solely to help me in cutting the cove to know the beginning and the ending. Next, rotate the sphere to the next set of index marks. Mark my cove edge lines, cut the flat, and cut the cove. This is a great time to practice starting the cut with the gouge closed, meaning the cutting tip is vertical. Otherwise, especially with the intermittent cuts, the gouge will skate, giving nasty threads. You may note that I forgot to drill before the cove and have to estimate where it should be. For the third time, rotate and remount the sphere on the next index marks. The cuts are getting harder now with more cutting across previous coves. Again, practicing good tool control pays off to get clean cuts without skate threads. For the last time, rotate and remount the sphere on the next index marks. The last time and this time, note that the mounting point is at the bottom of the cove cut already. That's why drilling the marks pays off. The last cove is the hardest. I cannot mark the ridges, but I have to sneak up on the previous edges. Cutting this last cove is a really wild ride. The next part results from a long time thinking about how to do it with several attempts and several failures. The original was large and had enough wood to hold together when hollowing. This project as a small ornament tends to break when hollowing. So instead, I am drilling half inch holes with a Forstner bit on the drill press. A vise with gentle pressure holds the ornament in place for a gentle drill punch. After drilling each hole, I can either leave it as is or do some carving. I'm leaving it this as is. It is already very light. Now for a finial. I'm using cherry this time. The wood is mounted to the chuck with long nose jaws. After roughing, the first order of business is to cut a tenon to fit the center hole on the ornament. This tenon will do double duty. Mount to the chuck later and mount to the ornament when finished. A skew does a great job at cutting a tenon. Then, while still mounted, I can rough out the top finial before parting it off at an appropriate length. While the wood is still in the chuck, I'm doing the same thing for the bottom finial. That is, cut and fit the tenon and rough out the finial. Now I can mount the top finial and finish shaping it. I like short stubby top finials, but before I go too far, I need a hole for the top hanger. After marking a divot at the center, I'm holding my smallest drill bit in pliers to drill the hole. Without the divot, it would skate wildly. Then sand this finial and apply shellac friction polish. Finials don't take much sanding at all. Certainly, a small fraction of the sanding required for a bowl. Now to remount the bottom finial and shape it to a pleasing shape. No hard and fast rules here, but my guidelines are gradually get smaller, balance delicate with strength, 
avoid sharp pointed ends for safety. My skew is my preferred tool here as it leaves the best finish for me. Your mileage may vary. After sanding and finishing with shellac friction polish, I can add a hanger and glue the finials to the body. This turning resembles a sea urchin, but has never seen an ocean. It took me several attempts to develop a process to scale it down for an ornament. By the way, I'm presenting this demonstration to a couple of local wood turning clubs as a live interactive remote demonstration. I'm also planning a live interactive remote demonstration to my website subscribers on May 17th, 2020. To receive my announcement emails, you have to be subscribed to my website directly. If you haven't already, be sure to go to my website, aswoodturns.com, to subscribe to be notified of future live demonstrations. Please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe on my website, tell your friends, and send me your comments and questions. Every week I make a new wood turning video and add to the over 400 videos to choose from on my website. Please wear your full face shield anytime the lathe is running. Until next week's video, this is Alan Stratton from Aswood Turns.